Decisions of the European Court of Human Rights holding that the UK's blanket ban on voting by convicted prisoners violates the right to uh, free elections under Article 3 of Protocol 1 to the European Convention on Human Rights have caused controversy in the UK. One reason for this is that many people in the UK have a very retributive attitude towards criminals. As a society, we don't seem to be interested in what happens to people once they go behind bars, although Rule 3 of the Prison Rules 1999 says the purpose of the training and treatment of convicted prisoners shall be to encourage and assist them to lead a good and useful life. A second reason uh, for the controversy is that attention has been diverted away from the merits of the issue to a different question. Who should decide whether prisoners are to be allowed to vote? Should it be the Queen in Parliament, by way of an Act of Parliament, or judges of the European Court of Human Rights? The debate has generated more heat than light and has been the subject of some extravagant rhetorical exaggeration. The Prime Minister, Mr Cameron, said in Parliament in 2010, it makes me physically ill even to contemplate having to give the vote to anyone who is in prison. More soberly, in 2011, the House of Commons resolved by 234 votes to 22 that it noted the relevant decision of the European Court of Human Rights in a case called Hearst and the United Kingdom in which it held, among other things, that there had been no substantive debate by members of the legislature on the continued justification for maintaining a general restriction on the right of prisoners to vote. It acknowledges the treaty obligations of the UK and is of the opinion that legislative decisions of this nature should be a matter for democratically elected lawmakers and supports the current position in which no prisoner is able to vote except those imprisoned for contempt, default or on remand. Now, I want to try to clarify some of the issues by saying a word or two about each of three questions. The first question is, what sort of right is the right to vote? And how, in a society which long ago adopted a universal adult franchise, did prisoners get left out? Secondly, how did the European Court of Human Rights come to decide that the UK's approach to prisoners voting violated the ECHR? And thirdly, is there a clash, as is suggested by some, between the judgment of the court and the sovereignty of either the UK or of its parliament. So I'll start with the right to vote. Let's go back to 1832. Before 1832, the right to vote was governed by property. In general, voters had to satisfy a property test, and it was specifically estates in relation to land in order to be allowed to vote. Um, in consequence, the right to vote was seen itself as a form of property. In 1702, in a case called Ashby and White, a plaintiff recovered damages from an election officer who had wrongly refused to allow him to exercise his right to vote. Under these conditions, it would be very unusual, as one can imagine, for a person qualified to vote to be in prison. Most people in prison were poor people, so there was no issue as to whether prisoners should be allowed to vote. The sort of people who went to prison would not have been able to vote even had they been free. When the franchise was progressively extended, starting with the 1832 Reform Act, and Parliament created an increasing number of criminal offences, particularly in the second half of the 20th century and the early part of the 21st, it became more and more likely that people qualified to vote would be in prison at the time of an election. The prison population, for example, rose from under 20,000 in 1900 to almost 89,000 by the end of 2011. Of these, 90% uh, had been convicted of crimes and were serving their sentences. About 9% were on remand awaiting trial and 1% uh, 
uh, were in prison uh, for non-criminal reasons. It follows then that about 80,000 people at the end of 2011 were disenfranchised. Now, in the 19th century, denying convicted prisoners a vote wasn't philosophically problematic. Um, unlike those people who voted by virtue of property qualifications and so had seen the vote as a right, the new wider electorate had never been able to vote before. Not extending the vote to prisoners didn't therefore deprive them of any right, they were merely refused the grant of a new right. But by the time the UK's electorate was based on universal adult suffrage, one might have expected serious consideration to be given to the remaining categories of non-voters, of which prisoners formed the main group. But the refusal to allow them to vote was carried forward without serious debate in successive pieces of legislation. Indeed, there was no discussion of it during the passage of the most recent piece of relevant legislation, the Representation of the People Act 1983. Now that's partly explicable on the basis that the law had traditionally regarded convicted prisoners as being without any rights. By the early 1980s, however, the position was changing. The common law was starting to recognise that convicted prisoners retained those rights which were not inevitably taken away by virtue of the very fact of imprisonment. Convicts went to prison as punishment, not for punishment. Prisons were no longer no-go areas for judges. This brings us to the European Convention and the right to vote. Developments in inter international law complemented the changing attitude in the UK towards prisoners and their rights. The UK was a party to Protocol 1 to the European Convention on Human Rights. That's a treaty binding on states in international law, but only if the states have agreed to be bound. Article 3 provides, and I quote, right to free elections. The high contracting parties, that is the states, undertake to hold free elections at reasonable intervals by secret ballot under conditions which will ensure the free expression of the people in the choice of the legislature. It's the end of the article. Now that doesn't sound like a strong assertion of a universal right to vote, but the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg interpreted it in the light of other human rights treaties including Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1976, to which the UK is a party again, and of the constitutional traditions of uh, member states of the Council of Europe. On that basis, the court held that there was a right implicit in the article to universal adult suffrage unless there's a justification, a legitimate justification, for restricting a particular person's right to be either a candidate or an elector. The court decided that in 1987 in a case called Mathieu Mohan and Claire Fight against Belgium. Now, to establish a justification for interfering with the right, a state would have to show that the restriction first served a legitimate aim and secondly was proportionate to it. As thus interpreted, the ECHR reinstates participation in elections for the legislature as a right. But now it's a human right, not a property right. In other words, everyone has the right and states have to justify taking it away from them. It might be justi justifiable, for example, to refuse to allow non-nationals or non-residents to vote. But other categories of people are more difficult to exclude and their exclusion requires greater justification. In the UK, this matter came to a head when prisoners started to bring cases to the Strasbourg court, claiming that the UK's blanket ban on their voting violated their right under Article 3 of Protocol 1. 
in Hearst, which I mentioned earlier in 2004, a chamber of the Strasbourg court accepted, although somewhat doubtfully, that there might have been a legitimate aim for the ban in that the state wanted to deter crime, but decided that it was not proportionate to the aim because it didn't differentiate between types of offences or between the circumstances of individual offenders and offences. The UK had argued that the court should give weight through the instrument of a doctrine known as the margin of appreciation to the judgment of Parliament that such a ban was justified. This argument failed, however, because the ban as I said a moment ago, had not actually been debated during the passage of the 1983 Representation of the People Act. So it wasn't clear what judgment, if any, Parliament had made concerning the relevant weights of competing factors. The Chamber's judgment in Hearst was confirmed by the Grand Chamber of the Court in 2005. When the UK failed to take action to implement the decision, um, and the court was plagued by a growing number of applications from UK prisoners, um, the court took action in 2010 to stem the tide. It implemented what's known as the pilot judgment procedure against the UK, um, whereby it set a timetable for the UK to bring forward measures to remove the violation. This caused a good deal of annoyance among parliamentarians in the UK because it seemed to be calling in question proceedings in Parliament. No domestic court could do that. It would be improper because it would breach Article 9 of the Bill of Rights 1689. But the Strasbourg Court is an international tribunal which isn't bound by national constitutional law. Before the Strasbourg Court, the state is the respondent, not a particular institution of the state. The court has to decide whether the state as a whole is responsible for a violation of a convention right. It does not matter for the purpose of international law how a state chooses to organize its internal constitutional arrangements. Now, one might ask, why should the Strasbourg Court be able to dictate to the UK what its franchise should be, and why should the matter be decided by a judicial rather than legislative body? The answer to both those questions is the same. The Strasbourg Court has that responsibility because the UK conferred it on the court. Under the original form of the ECHR, which the UK uh, ratified in the 1950, States could choose whether or not to accept the jurisdiction of the court to receive applications from individuals complaining of violations of their convention rights. The UK accepted that jurisdiction, although not until 1965, and the acceptance took effect in 1966. It then periodically renewed its acceptance of that jurisdiction until the 1990s. A new treaty, Protocol 11 to the Convention, was then agreed by all the member, member states of the Council of Europe, including the UK. It amended the text of the ECHR to provide for the compulsory jurisdiction of the court in respect of individual applications. Since that protocol came into force, the UK has therefore had no choice in the matter, but that was itself a result of the UK's own choice to ratify Protocol 11. The court hasn't seized the power to apply the convention to states. States, including the UK, voluntarily imposed on the court a duty to do so. That brings me to the third issue. Does that mean that there's a clash between the UK's sovereignty or its parliament's sovereignty and the court? The answer to that, I think, is no. By virtue of its sovereignty in international law, the UK is entitled to enter into treaties. It did so. The ECHR and those protocols to which the UK is a party are the result of an exercise by the UK of its sovereignty. Like any other 
contract, and a treaty is a contract, a treaty is made to be obeyed. As they say, pacta sunt servanda. Contracting parties aren't free to discard their obligations on, under a treaty unilaterally when they feel it's convenient to do so. That would be a breach of international law. Where, as in the ECHR, a treaty provides for disputes to be determined authoritatively and finally by a judicial body, in this case the European Court of Human Rights, it's not open to a party to the treaty to complain about the process to which it has agreed when a decision goes against it. Does that result in a clash between the court as a judicial body and the legislative sovereignty of the Queen in Parliament, one part of which, the House of Commons, is electorally accountable? Again, I think the answer is no. The Strasbourg Court hasn't told the UK what it is to do, it only said that the present position cannot be justified under the ECHR because of the indiscriminate character of the ban on prisoners voting. In the most recent case, Scopola against Italy in 2012, in which the UK intervened, the Grand Chamber made it clear that Article 3 of Protocol 1 doesn't even require an individualised judicial decision in each case as part of the sentencing process. An Act of Parliament can lay down bright line rules as long as the rules are related to the nature of the offences and the circumstances of offenders. This leaves considerable discretion to the legislature. Admittedly it limits its room for manoeuvre, but then so does any rule of international law. I hope that these reflections on the question of who should decide will have cleared away some uh, misconceptions uh, and will allow us to turn our attention to the really important matter, which is what is the best rule. On this, I will offer just two brief concluding thoughts. First, it seems odd to me that the UK's parliamentarians should place such emphasis on the electoral accountability of the House of Commons as a source of Parliament's authority, yet routinely deny about 80,000 people the right to vote in elections to that House. Secondly, the present position has an arbitrary impact. People who begin a sentence the day after an election or are released from prison the day before it can vote. People who are imprisoned for contempt of court and are still in prison can vote. People who are imprisoned for shoplifting or drunken behaviour in public can't. Most curiously, perhaps, people who are fined for stuffing fake ballot papers into ballot boxes but are not imprisoned can vote. People imprisoned for helping a terminally ill loved one to end her life voluntarily can't. We really do need, I suggest, to think seriously about the circumstances which justify depriving a person of the right to vote.